Hello and welcome to India's World. Today we are discussing Sri Lanka and the upcoming meeting of the UN Human Rights Commission in Geneva. In the Human Rights Commission, the United States is expected to bring in a resolution to put pressure on Sri Lanka to make its security forces and its uh, uh, society and its politics accountable for human rights violations during the uh, war on LTTE. It will also probably put pressure on uh, preventing threats uh, to the judiciary and put pressure on Sri Lanka to devolve power to the Tamil majority provinces of Sri Lanka in the north and in the east. Now, this resolution poses a dilemma for India. We're going to discuss what is this dilemma and why does India find itself in the position that it does. To discuss this, I have with me three very distinguished guests. I have Ambassador Lalit Man Singh, a formidable uh, diplomat and also a member of the non-official group of friends of Sri Lanka which seeks to help Sri Lanka in the reconstruction and rehabilitation, reconciliation uh, after the conflict. We have Professor Sadevan from the School of International Studies in Jawaharlal Nehru University. He's written several books in, on pre and post conflict Sri Lanka. And we have Dr. A.M.S. Nachepan. He's the uh, Congress MP from Tamil Nadu, but also an eminent lawyer, educationist, and a human rights activist. And you've been agitated about what's happening in Sri Lanka. You visited Sri Lanka several times. So welcome all of you to the show. Ambassador Man Singh, let me begin with you. Uh, why does the international community feel the need to bring these resolutions uh, against Sri Lanka? What is it that Sri Lanka is not doing right? Because last year there was a resolution and again we expect a resolution now. What is it that the international community want, want, want to do to, to, uh, for Sri Lanka to do? Well, there's a new climate of opinion in the international community and it is against any kind of systematic violation of human rights. And unfortunately, in the case of Sri Lanka, there has been a suspicion that there were significant violations of international law and humanitarian rights during the closing years of the conflict in Sri Lanka in 2009. Yeah. It is estimated that 40,000 civilians were killed in the last few months. And there are suspicions that these were people killed in cold blood by the security forces. This is the issue that the international community wants to, to, uh, to know about and find the truth about and to make sure that these things don't happen again. A second concern is about Sri Lanka's slight towards constitutional dictatorship. That's always a matter of concern because the movement is towards democracy. And the whole of South so Asia... What, what are the indicators? The indicators are, first of all, uh, the 18th Amendment, which removed the term limits for the president. Yeah. It also brought certain powers directly to the president, including appointment of judges. And we saw recently that the president used his majority in parliament to impeach a sitting chief justice against the protests of the, of the judiciary, of the civil society, and of international opinion. So these are disturbing signs. And that is why the Human Rights Council uh, tables these res resolutions and countries have to express a view on that. Okay. Professor Sadevan, uh, tell me uh, something about why does India find itself in a dilemma on such a vote? Is it because of our own soft underbelly in Kashmir? Because we used to get hot and bothered under the collar whenever there was a resolution against Kashmir. <coughs> so we are, we are wary of, of these resolutions. Yeah, that seems, seems to be one factor, but mm -hmm. I think it's one has to look beyond that in a way as the external affairs minister said the other day that we don't really consider Sri Lanka as an enemy country. I mean, the relationship in the past where actually, you know, had difficulties and all that. But now I think that we really, in a way, uh, do a greater engagement with the regime there. But at the same time that you look at the, the other, you know, the, 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 the issues related to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, moral position and so on and so forth, we really caught between, you know, one level that we have a greater engagement. The other thing is the whole moral pr pressure comes in because obviously it's difficult for India to accept uh, you know, um, large-scale human rights violations taking place in the neighborhood. And then you really have, you know, sort of uh, pressure that is mounting on from the internal political constituency. It's a very tight uh, rope walk for the India because, you know, you need to really sort of harmonize and, you know, sort of, you know... No, but is, is voting with the U.S. resolution one way of doing it or are there other ways? I think if you really take a moral consideration in mind, I think we keep that uh, position in mind. I think that if you really go along with the voting, along with the United States and other countries who are really going to vote for the resolution, 
you really sort of morally upright. Okay. But at the same time, it may really have a political consequences because last time also a lot, all kinds of reactions came from Sri Lanka. Yeah. Uh, to the extent that we need to really falsify Sri Lanka by writing a letter to the pres you know, President Rajabakshi. Yeah. So we are caught between the two sort of okay. Uh, forces. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Nachepun, last year India actually helped Sri Lanka by diluting the resolution, right? So that there was no direct uh, intervention, monitoring, etc. It was all advice, assistance, and so on and so forth. Now tell me, what, were, what have been the tangible benefits of diluting that resolution? Have there been any tangible benefits? Actually, we have to look into the issue. <clears throat> In a different aspect, that is, uh, uh, we have got a stake on the people of Sri Lanka. The people of Sri Lanka are uh, more than 15 lakh people who are from Indian origin. They are having all kith and kins in uh, Tamil Nadu itself. They are coming and going. Assets are there in both the places. Uh, similarly, the Tamil people who are living in North and East people, they are also ethnically, uh, they are connected with the Tamil people. But they are original inhabitants there. Oh, original yeah. inhabitants. And uh, the eastern part is dominated by the Muslims, uh, Tamil-speaking Muslims. They are also from uh, Tirunelveli and Kanyakumari, yeah. Tutukudi, this uh, area of Tamil uh, area. They are coming and going. We have to see that their protection, their assets, their occupation should also be protected. So, but but by diluting time, the UN resolution, how have you done that? Actually, I don't find any dilution except the things that we want to say that LLRC already you have you appointed that is the it. lessons learnt and reconciliation commission. Yes, the Sri Lankan government itself. Yes, they appointed, they gave the findings. Why you are not implementing it? That is accountable. Why you are asking somebody from some other country to monitor it? Instead of that, let us give them an opportunity to monitor themselves yes. and come out with the international forum. That is the only thing we, we yeah, said it. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, sure. Well, uh, I just want to add to what he said. Firstly, I want to clarify. It's not that Tamils only who are of Indian origin. The singulars are also of Indian origin. Way, way back, at, way, way back. I, I, I want to claim that many of them came Went from my from part of the country, <laughs> from Kalinga. Yeah. So, uh, we have no stakes in terms of any preference for any ethnic community. Okay. We want everybody to be treated equal under the uh, Sri Lanka constitution. But the reason why uh, you, you use the term dilution, I think we worked at softening the language yeah. uh, because we believe that the Sri Lankan government was sincere in accepting the LLRC reports. It had accepted them. It was carrying on negotiations with the leaders of the Tamil communities. Yeah. And it seemed to be sensitive to international opinion. But has that faith been belied? Uh, I would say... In, in a single word, yes. Okay, I need to take a break at this juncture. Uh, we'll be back soon and carry on with this interesting discussion. Don't go away. <music> Welcome back. We are discussing India's dilemma over the UNHRC re resolution on Sri Lanka. Uh, Ambassador Man Singh, you know, uh, UN or international community gets agitated if you break international laws, covenants, agreements. So which are the laws, agreements, or covenants that the Sri Lanka uh, government or its army has broken during the war, which allows uh, the UN to uh, adopt such resolutions, which gets the international community agitated? That there is international law and there are international conventions. There is something called the International Humanitarian Conventions, and there are the various Geneva agreements on this, which is that uh, if you have got captives after a conflict or a war, you do not torture them, you do not kill them. And so many of these conventions ha ha have been accepted by the community. And there is this, as I mentioned, a suspicion that these conventions were not followed in the last few months of the conflict. Is Sri Lanka party to all these conventions? The, all all the, the entire international community is presumed to be a party to these conventions. Okay. Now, uh, Sri Lanka denies that uh, these violations took place. And they think that this number of 40,000 is exaggerated. Now, last year, they accepted that they will carry out their investigations and come up with the truth. And the LLRC was also supposed to establish the truth. The sad thing is that one year after these assurances were given, uh, none of these assurances have been fulfilled. Yeah. On the other hand, we are seeing a continuation yeah. of the kind of deprivations that were going on in terms of disappearances, on the treatment of the Tamils, yeah. on the number of homeless people, which is now at least 90,000 out of the original. But Sri Lanka year. claims that everybody has been uh, resettled. There are no more camps. The international community's estimate is that about 90,000 are still displaced. 
and they have to be uh, resettled. Okay. okay, we'll come to that. Uh, uh, Professor Sadevan, uh, you know, any reconciliation begins when the two sides to a conflict agree to the truth. You know, that's why you named the commission in uh, uh, South Africa was called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Similarly, in Nepal, now they're setting up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So unless the two sides accept how the tragedy unfolded and what its consequences were, how can reconciliation begin? Because in Sri Lanka, the attempt seems to be that there's only one truth, mm. and that is the truth spoken by the government of President Rajapaksa. No, interestingly, the whole definition of uh, reconciliation actually has got a very different connotation. Mm. It's all, you know, Sri Lanka defined uh, the term. Mm. Now, what they say is, I think, so far as the normal sea, concern, normal sea is concerned in the northern eastern provinces, so far as the economic development that is taking place, these are the, actually the routes to reconciliation, which is not the definition perhaps you and me are really sort of uh, willing to accept. Now, you need to really say that the problem here is, I think, what is said and what is done are quite different. What is promised to India, what is given to on the ground is different. Now, when you have a, such a huge disparity in terms of the level of trust between the Tamils and Tamil leaders and the, and the government, uh, you are not really sort of uh, finding any way out of that. Yeah. The problem here is that the government of Sri Lanka sort of seems to be really having a track policy, a one-track policy, which is actually defined by itself. I mean, you are right very much. I think that you need, it's a collective venture. In a way, reconciliation after a long duration of war needs to involve every stakeholder, but this is not happening really. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nachepun, um, see, the LLRC, or the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission that the Sri Lankan government set up, made certain recommendations. Now, the, the Office of the UN Human Rights Commissioner says that none of those recommendations have been acted upon, or if they've been acted upon, they've been selectively acted upon. Yes, there were, as a delegation from the Indian Parliament, yeah. we went there immediately after the resolution, last resolution being voted. And when we discussed with them, they were having the regular bureaucratic explanation that, you know, interdepartmental issues are there, therefore we have to resolve it, then only we can implement it. But I don't think in a small country you cannot have that type of excuses. You have to headlong see and show to the public and also the international community that they are genuine in solving the problem and developing the, uh, their own country in a proper uh, situation of a peace uh, being settled there. Yeah. Ambassador, you know, uh, based on the LLRC and after the resolution, mm -hmm. uh, the Sri Lankan government set up uh, and formulated something called a national action plan. Right. Now, this national action plan has been criticized by the UN, saying that where it, it first of all, it picks up the recommendations selectively. Mm -hmm. There's no rationale given for this selection. There's uh, uh, no explanation why some have been dropped and why some have been picked up. The and where uh, they uh, uh, prescribe action, sometimes the action has nothing to do with the recommendation or the action is actually a continuation of existing uh, practices. So why is this happening? Well, uh, that's a question, a legitimate question for the Sri Lankan government. Mm -hmm. But let's start with the original uh, uh, movement for change, the 13th Amendment. And we were assured that it's not only the 13th Amendment, but the Rajapaksa government was considering 13th Amendment plus, yeah. going beyond the 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Now, has the 13th Amendment been, uh, been implemented? Because it's constitutional. Uh, law in Sri Lanka. Well, in terms of devolution, let's take devolution only. There's supposed to be political devolution, financial devolution, and cultural devolution. Yeah. We are not seeing this happening. The powers are still centralized in Colombo yeah. in the hands of the president. Yeah, we will talk about devolution yes, in, in a yes, while. In a yes. while. So we'll come to that. Yes. Professor Sadhavan, tell me something. Um, Human Rights Watch has come out with a devastating report, yeah. which actually says that not only during the war, uh, there was rape and uh, sexual abuse of uh, prisoners uh, and detainees, that this uh, practice is continuing till today. True. Now, yeah. this is absolutely shocking. Now, how does Sri Lanka expect that these kinds of reports will come and the world will uh, keep quiet and not say anything? No, I think this is one thing happened was that one, the, the, what the Sri Lankan government earlier thought, um, you know, it thought that the world did not know what really went wrong there in the war time. Um, it, it seems to be, I think, they are really off, taken by surprise by all these developments. The second is, I think that, you know, you have a very emboldened government, which is very nationalistic, and also really seems to really sort of claim that, you know, they have full control of the, uh, you know, the national affairs. It seems to be also the fact, I think, the army and the paramilitary forces have really enjoyed enormous amount of power. I don't know whether really sort of the political control is really sort of maintained so rigorously as we do in the case of India. 
Um, one perhaps also do not know what's happening on the ground in Athene East and what is being said and formulated in, in Colombo. The fact is, I think that's in the government of Sri Lanka, at one level, the leadership wants to like centralize it yeah. uh, without sort of really sort of, you know, making, uh, exercising very deep control over yeah. some of the forces yeah. and operations okay. there. Uh, Dr. Nachepan, why is there a refusal to learn lessons? You have something called lessons learnt and reconciliation commission. There are no lessons learnt and there's no reconciliation. It's almost as if, you know, th these words mean nothing to the Sri Lankan government. That's true. They're because they, they feel that... Uh, they got just, uh, they have to satisfy a certain group of the people, sector of the people who are living in Sri Lanka. Uh, you, more mean or less less. Huh? you mean the Sinhalas? Yes, they, they want to satisfy their uh, f fancy of uh, yeah. winning over other ethnic group and other things. Yeah. Therefore, they prolong the things. Another thing I could find out after a deep discussion is, they, have, they want to improve their economic condition. That is totally, it is uh, uh, eroded now. Okay. After war, they are very much poor, we'll but they are not we'll, showing it. Like we'll it. come to reconstruction. We need to uh, take a break at this juncture. We'll continue with this interesting discussion after the break. Don't go away. <music> Welcome back. We are discussing the upcoming resolution on Sri Lanka in the UNHCR in Geneva and India's dilemma on how to vote on that uh, resolution and how to help Sri Lanka deal with its minority problem. Uh, Ambassador, let me come to you. Would you agree that the Tamil diaspora and the international community focuses more on the past, on war crimes, crimes against humanity, and India's focus seems more on uh, reconstruction, rehabilitation, and this, this disjunction between what the international community and the Tamil diaspora is doing and what India is doing? Well, India, India also believes that uh, the past should be investigated and if, if violations have taken place. But there's more focus on uh, rehabilitation. Yeah, certainly, you're right. Yeah. There is more focus on moving forward. Yeah. Let there be reconstruction, rehabilitation. But the, the, uh, the essential question is, are the Tamil citizens of Sri Lanka receiving equal treatment with the other citizens? And this is the basis of the, uh, the, the discussion on devolution. Now, the Sri Lankan government has a point of view. It's too small a country to be divided into federal units which will have autonomy. But they had also recognized at one point, which led to the 13th Amendment, that the Tamil areas require a special dispensation because of the history and the nature of the conflict, which means that you must give Tamil culture its rightful place, the Tamil language, and also in terms of reversing decades of Sinhalization, which uh, established power in the hands of the Sinhala majority. There has been demand that local bodies and the provincial government should get essential powers, Tamil should be employed in the local areas, Tamil should be used, all that. Official language, second official uh, yeah. language. Now, much of that which was promised at the government level yeah. is not taking place. And we are in fact seeing a reversal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Talk, talk about going back on the 13th Amendment. No, no, you had, uh, Professor Sadevan, you actually had uh, the president on, uh, in his independence day speech saying that 13th Amendment uh, shouldn't be there. His mm. brother, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, says that it should be repealed. So do you think uh, President Rajapaksa has uh, two faces, you know, one for his Sinhala constituency and another for India and the international community? Absolutely, you put it very correctly in the sense, I think that's the all kinds of promises made to not only the Indian leaders, but also anyone who actually visited uh, India representing the government of India. You know, one finds it, I think it's a quite lot of uh, dissimilarity in what he really says and what he really promises. In a way, I think when the opposition leader went there, Mrs. Swaraj, um, after the dialogue with him, and she came out with the you know press statement, and which was actually disowned by the you know the government of Sri Lanka in a way. I think this kind of politics and diplomacy it won't really take Sri Lanka far yeah. in a way at all. Dr. Nachepan, I made a, a rough count. Uh, President Rajapaksa has promised at least seven times from public platforms that he will give 13th Amendment plus uh, devolution of power to uh, the, the the Tamil minority. And each time, within, within days of his making those comments, he goes back on it. Yet India continues to buy whatever he says. So do you think the Indian government, uh, you know, sort of keeps showing trust in President Rajapaksa and at the same time trying to, uh, tries to fool the, the, the Tamil Nadu uh, politicians uh, by saying no, that, but we are pushing Tamil them Nadu, for... Tamil Nadu politicians are not very much focusing upon the devolution and other things. Hmm. They are very much focused on the diaspora's issues and other things. But actually, the Indian government is very clear 
that Rajiv Gandhi Jayavardhan Accord, which led to the 13th Amendment, right. has got three parts. One is na Tamil should be the national uh, national language and also the link language. That yeah. is the one of the official languages yeah. uh, that should be acted upon. Number two is North and East as an ethnic groups uh, area. Therefore, the, you have to separate it. Uh, for their administrative purposes yeah. and I think. Thirdly, 37 powers are to be devolved. As Ambassador has said, the 37 powers were given not only for uh, uh, North and East, it is for the entire nine provinces, which includes Sinhalese people also. When we discussed with the MPs from Singhala area, they are also anxious to get that devolution. Therefore, devolution is a part of the democratic process which they have to accept it. It has been given by Rajiv Gandhi. It has to be acted upon. Otherwise, there is no solution for Sri Lanka at all. Okay. Professor Sadevan, uh, you know, why does India not get agitated or why doesn't India tell Sri Lanka to reduce the military presence in civilian administration in the north and the east? Why doesn't India tell them that, look, disappearances are still continuing? Yeah. What are these white van gangs that uh, go and True, kidnap yeah. people and, you know, no, why no. are editors being killed? Why are journalists being harassed? Of late, what I really find, I think that, you know, we don't really have a, you know, regional policy which was in a way, um, you know, incorporate all these concerns of India. I think we want to be very safe with the neighbors now. We don't want to be seen as somebody who is bullying and we don't really seen as a hegemonic. And this issue, I think the TNA leaders took up with the Indian government of India, leader, India and it seems to have been told by them. I think it looks like this is an internal issue. How do we expect expect us to really sort of, you know, go and tell the Rajabaksha regime, please don't do it and do, do all that, you know. I think this is quite a, you know, you know, sense of helplessness one could really see. I don't know. I'm, I think the you know New Delhi is convinced about uh, the the kind of things which is really happening. But wasn't New Delhi uh, putting pressure on the TNA MPs to join the Parliamentary Select Committee on Devolution? Is In a way, used? it seems no, because you know I met them when they came here last time. I mean, we asked him, asked uh, Mr. Samban then. He said this is not an issue at all. Mm -hmm. But what was written in Colombo newspapers are quite different. In a way, I think India is very clear. I think that we you know we expect the TNA to be a part of the process that is taking place, but we don't want to be actually pushy from the scene and beyond a point. Yeah. Ambassador, uh, no, you wanted to say something on this? Well, I, 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 I want to come back to the point you started with. Yeah. What is our dilemma in Sri Lanka? Yeah. The dilemma is that we have got broader interests in Sri Lanka, strategic interests, economic interests. And so they can't be defined only by the Tamil issue. Yeah. The Tamil issue is important and very important and it's immediate. But we have broader strategic interests, which is why when you say, why doesn't the government of India ask them to do this, that, the other? A, that's not our style. We don't use the big stick and say, we are bigger, stronger, you better carry out our wishes. It has to be a process of internal dialogue. But secondly... But that dialogue doesn't uh, result in anything. So then what do you well, do? Well, the international... The should then do nothing. No, no. The international pressure is building up. You, you will recall that when in Fiji, a democratic government was overthrown, uh, India took the lead in the Commonwealth to get Fiji expelled. That's an extreme step. Yeah. But I'm saying there are different degrees of pressure and one doesn't have to use the stick right in the beginning. Yeah. Secondly, don't be... We are running out of time. So don't yeah. be unmindful of our wider strategic interest for yeah. which we must keep the dialogue with Sri Lanka yeah. going. Okay, we've run out of time. Uh, I thank uh, all of you for sharing your analysis of Sri Lanka and India's dilemma with our viewers. Uh, that's all we have for you today. We'll be back again next week with another issue. Till then, goodbye.